Rosie, I want everyone here to hear because again, we talk so much about, you know, I go on the road so much and women are like, oh, I'm a single mom, I can't do that right now. You had double trouble, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> double trouble. And I know that you had a very difficult time when they, were, when they were little boys. And, you know, just being a single mom, can you talk about, I think for all of us, we, we, it's hard for us to even admit when you first are a single mom, like, that wasn't our dream for our life, am I right? That's right. Um, I think we all think the Prince Charming, the, it's going to work out forever. I'm going to live happily ever after with this person. Uh, I'm going to give it all I've got, and it's going to happen. And you never think about growing old without, and you never think of what it's like to raise boys and not have a father to bounce off of. Uh, it, or, you know, are we doing this right? Um, so yes, it was, it was extremely difficult. Their dad left when they were about eight years old. Uh, but fortunately, and I know I was fortunate, I had a mother who lived with me. How many of us have that, right? Our mothers help us. Yeah. And I know that not everybody does, but it made a big difference because that means that I wasn't paying daycare. Uh, she lived with me and she was a big help in, have, in helping me to raise them. And a big help, too, in passing the culture, in passing the history, things that I wouldn't talk about, for example, about the Chicano movement. At that time, I couldn't a whole lot about. She would tell them about it. And I'm very grateful for that uh, because I think between the two of us, there are a lot of values that they picked up on that, um, that I see in them today. So when I know back then, and you've talked a lot about it, you were working, struggling money-wise. You were telling me that San Antonio was in a very bad place back then. Just there was a lot of turmoil going on. Talk a little bit about that journey. Well, you know, when you look at San Antonio, we're the seventh largest city in the nation. And a lot of people don't realize that. But the first modern-day Latino, remember we're 65% Latino in San Antonio, the first modern-day mayor for San Antonio that was a Latino was Henry Cisneros, and that was in the 1980s. Uh, so Julian is really only the third one. Uh, so really, though, the city never had the riots and that kind of things. There was a lot of racially segregated living. Uh, the economy was not something that Latinos had control of. For example, we didn't own banks, so we weren't on bank boards. Uh, we were not the CEOs of things. So for a lot of Latinos, there was traditionally being a teacher, being a nurse, being a social worker. Uh, those kinds of things were primarily what people did. Uh, for a long time, in downtown San Antonio even, Latinos didn't work even at shops. Now, a lot of that, of course, has changed. But when I'm young and coming up um, and starting my career, uh, I finally do wind up working for the city of San Antonio, which is another thing. Government was what a lot of Latinos used to get out of poverty. Uh, and so even while I was with the city and my sons were young, uh, I was still not yet earning the kind of income that I needed to support a family of four. So you, and you made a kind of a radical decision because I know you went, you went back to school later. Yes. So how did you make that decision and how could you even do that? Well, you know, it's very interesting because one of my messages is how your friends and how other people around you really make a difference in your life. I had a friend, and she was a teacher, and she came to me, she says, oh, you're always saying you want to go back to school. Ten years later, right, from my, my BA, she says, you're always saying, here's a program at UTSA, University of San Antonio, Texas, San Antonio, and it'll pay for part of that tuition because I never had money, I didn't have the time, I had to work, you know, every excuse. She said, You're, you gotta go with me, we're gonna go. And so we went, she took me in her car because I didn't have a car at that time. We went to long way, UTSA, um, that took about two, three buses to get to, and I wound up going to school Get for the masters, and she wound up not going to that program, but she went to another's. But if it hadn't been for her saying, well, you're always saying, you know, come on, I'm driving you there, we can apply, and so I did, and boom, I wound up with a master's, and I wound up wow. working for the city of San Antonio. Wow, that's incredible. And I know you talk a lot about 
how getting that master's changed your economic profile. Absolutely. Um, even with the BA in San Antonio, and I saw many women go through that, especially Latinas. Um, we know that even today, when you look at women's amount of money that women earn to men's amount of money per dollar, uh, Latinas are still the lowest. I think it's 59 cents to the dollar. And so, you know, I looked at what my circumstances were. I knew that I wasn't getting jobs for another reason also, which was because of my activism in Rasunida, I would often be one of the top three candidates. And I think they did that because they were afraid I might cause trouble. But anyway, I was one of the top three candidates. I'd never get the job. And so, you know, I realized that with the BA, with this on my back, knowing that people had a bias, uh, I needed to go do something. And the minute that I got the master's, I was able to start at the city, my income increased greatly. Now we're into the 27,000, uh, you know, so, but that was great for me because at that time then my mother was living with me and uh, she basically had gotten ill. So though she could take care of my kids, she didn't have much of an income either. But it made all the difference because from there I went to Haku and then work with the San Antonio Housing Authority. And off and on, I would do things for myself. I would do consulting. And now I'm retired. But education for us, for the Castros, is the number one thing and value that we believe in. Uh, because we know that education is and can be the way out of poverty. And so. You know what's interesting, too? I think that we forget that our children are sponges of what we do. And like, for instance, for me, Rosie, because I went back to school, and I, it was something I always wanted to do, but what really pushed me is that my son said to me one day, well, why do I have to go to college? You've done really well, and you didn't go to college. And that really hurt me, because I thought that's what he knows. You know, your kids have done extraordinarily well in school. Let's talk about that, too. I mean, the fact that they saw you struggle and, and pasar trabajo and sacrifice you have to sacrifice to go back to school. But time passes anyway, right? It just, That's right. The time passes anyway. My four years went by like a blip. And then those kids will never think that they can't go to college. It's That's true. That's right. Um, kids, you know, I always say the thing about, like I saw with my kids and all of you probably see with yours is, even if they think, if you think they're not paying attention, <laughs> they're listening and they're absorbing. Um, and, and education was one of those things that you know, since they were very little, I said, look, everybody has a job here. Your grandmother takes care of you. I go work so we can live, and you go to school. And you're going to do the best job you can in school. And I have to admit, Nellie, I did things that people, psychologists say you shouldn't do. I bribed my sons. I said, OK. We don't have much, but every A is a dollar. Every B is 75 cents, you know, and so on. And actually, one of the things I found is that it didn't take even a year before they just wanted to do well. You didn't have to bribe them anymore. Tell them what schools your sons went to, because it's pretty impressive. <laughs> um, both of them wound up going to Stanford undergrad uh, for mass, for communications. They double majored and political science. Uh, and then went on to, took a break for a year, went back to San Antonio, worked, and then went on to Harvard Law School and graduated from Harvard Law School. That's incredible. I want to show a clip, Nancy, if you can play, that your son said at the convention that I think is very relevant to this audience. Can we play that? The American dream is not a sprint or even a marathon, but a relay. Our families don't always cross the finish line in the span of one generation, but each generation passes on to the next the fruits of their labor. My grandmother never owned a house. She cleaned other people's houses so she could afford to rent her own. But she saw her daughter become the first in her family to graduate from college. You see what I mean? I think it's important to ground us. You know, when we get stuck and we go, ah, yo no quiero hacer esto, I think we, we always think of our, the excuse sometimes is our kids or our families, and instead, that should be the reason we do it. I think Julian is right. It is a relay race. And every little piece of information gets marked in their brain. 
Just like if you have a mom that focuses just on men and puts men first, they're gonna think women are victims. We have to remember everything we imprint in those children goes on to the future generation. So look at what your son says about you. It would be a very different story if she had not shown him that example. Am I right? Sure, I think that uh, it's one thing to say things, but it's another thing to do them. Um, and with them too, one of the things that I drilled into their head uh, was the whole thing of how you treat a woman. You know, ever since they were very little, I try to say, look, uh, you never hit a woman, never. I don't care what, even if, if it's a little girl, you just don't do it. And they'd say, well, mom, what if they hit me? I said, well, A, you can walk away. B, you can go tell somebody in authority what's happened, but I don't care what they do to you. You never hit a woman. And there were many things like that, that, you know, from my own life, I felt that they needed, a, as they grew, they needed to know so that they would always show respect to women. And it was really funny, because in the fifth grade, Julian did a paper on uh, the, the women's vote. And he wrote about all these women that had worked to get the women's vote in the United States. Um, so I've always been so pleased that, like I say, though they don't always look like they're listening, they really do. Now let me ask you something. When, when you look at your sons, right, and, and you see how they've become these, I mean, they're like stars. And you think, to, can you even picture yourself? I mean, I picture you in the White House. I do. Do you dare to dream that big? You know, it's very difficult because you, you want the best for your sons and you want, and your children, you want to see what it is they want to achieve that they get there. But, you know, politics is a very difficult thing. Um, there's a lot of things that have to be come together for things to happen. This is a wonderful time for Latinos because things are finally opening up wider um, and we're getting the opportunity to march into places, I hope, where we have never been before, both Latinas and Latinos. Um, one of the difficulties for me, some time back, and even now, every once in a while I have to fight with, is the fact that, you know, if you're from Texas, you know what kind of a state that is, and it takes a lot of money to win elections, a lot of money. It's people power, but it's also money. And so I often would think when people say, well, Julian can be president, Joaquin can be governor, you know, all of these wonderful things, I thought, you know, one of the things I regret is that I did not go out and earn money. Because see, that's if why I had it out there. It's for you too. Well, I earned enough to live on, but I mean, you know, that I didn't really think, think of doing it. that because like many people in Texas that have always been able to get elected, I could have given my sons money. And that never came forward more than when Joaquin ran the first time. He had a candidate that ran against him that the people in Texas, a guy named Perry, he's a home builder, he's not Rick Perry, related to Rick Perry, and he just died. He put down $40,000 for that race. And another guy in San Antonio, 30,000. And we were over here, how do we make $10,000 for um, And I thought, gee, Rosie, you know, you can't even give your sons this money that they need to achieve their dreams. And then I started thinking, and my sons would say, you know what, we couldn't have gotten this far if you had not laid the groundwork. If all those people that came out to help us in elections hadn't known your work. Well, and I think it's what he says about the relay race. That's why we're talking about money today, right? Yeah. Because all of us have to go make money. That's why we're, it's, we can't have money be a dirty word anymore. Right. So that right. we can vote for people like your sons and give them donations. Absolutely. <laughs> but I think, you know, when I was growing up, money was kind of a dirty word. It's like I would do everything for volunteer. Volunteer this and volunteer that. But if somebody says, well, you know what, we're going to pay you. It's like, oh, no, I'll do it for volunteer. Really, because I thought that somehow money would corrupt me. And now I see that. You know, yeah, it can corrupt people, especially in politics, but that, unfortunately, you can't... You have to have money. You can't help people and make to. good public policy without getting to the table. No, and I think all of us Latinas, we tend to help everybody so much 
that we're wounded healers. We're not healing ourselves first. And we're not making money for ourselves first and taking care of our families first. It's so ayudar a todo el mundo, and then you realize the rest of the world, you can't get to these high places and put people in office that will help us if we don't vote for them and if we don't give them money. So absolutely. can you tell the ladies how important it is to vote for Latinos? Oh, absolutely. I'll tell you what. If you're not at the public policy table, and you can see it right now with the, shut, the shutdown of the government and all of the things that are happening, people, if you're not at the table, people don't care about your concerns. They don't care that the WIC programs won't be funded, that the Head Start won't be funded, that the veterans won't get their checks or the little old ladies like me won't get their social security. That's not on their agenda. So it's important that we and the people like us that want to see a different kind of agenda out there, that we have our folks elected to public office. Ever since I was young, that's one of the things that I realized very early, that if you want to make a change in this world, if you want to end a war, if you want to do whatever it is you want to do, you got to be at the public policy table. And if you don't vote, you're not at the public policy table. Um, some, of you, some of you were interested in, in running for a public office. There weren't a whole lot that raised their hands. I hope there's a lot more of you. And if you haven't looked at it, I hope that you do. You know if you look at the figures on women in the House or in the Senate, there's not enough. I bet you if you look at the figures on your house in this state, there's not enough. There's plenty of room for you to be the trailblazers. And Lord knows we need you. We need you. We need your children. Um, right now in Texas, we could have changed it, Nellie. That's a sad thing. We could be a different state in Texas if every Latino voted. voted. So ladies, I hope you heard it. And I hope you understand. Rosie, in your wildest dreams, come on. You, did you think when they were little that these kids would turn out this way? I never knew what they would turn out to be. But one of the things that I was really uh, was important to me was when I was little, I would have these crazy dreams. I wanted to be an, a paleontologist and an archaeologist. And I read books all the time, and rocks and dinosaurs. And you know, and people would say, you're stupid. You're never going to make it to college and to paleo. What the, what the hell are you even saying? You're not going to do it. And sometimes I wanted to be other weird things, and they'd say, at home or friend, it's not going to happen. And I swore that when I raised my children, I would never, I don't care how crazy the career was, I would never say, you can't make it. I would always say, OK. And I know when they were about seven or so, they wanted to be police officers. So I found friends that were police officers, brought them and said, tell them what it's like to be a police officer. You know, whatever it was they wanted. You want to be a boxer? Let me find somebody who boxes. What's it like to be a boxer? Whatever it was, I wanted them to know what we all say, that whatever you want to do, whatever you want to be, you can do it. And you can be it. Nobody's going to tell you you can't. You know, and I, I want to I end on a note because I think we don't realize, too, that the saying in Spanish, dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. The more, you know, your kids went to these great schools, you start meeting new people, you elevate yourself, you think bigger dreams. And we constantly have to think, who is smarter than us? Who is more beautiful than us? Who is more talented than us? And not be afraid of those people. Bring them on, because they will elevate you. Instead of what a lot of us do, which is, and it's human, you tend to want to fix people that are messed up, and you feel better about yourself. <laughs> but really, it's about elevating us, and elevating our community, and taking ourselves to a higher place to think bigger dreams and bigger thoughts. Am I right? Absolutely. Uh, I think I'm forever grateful, too. You know, my sons were gone. None of us had done a whole lot of traveling. But here they were, 2,000 miles away. And I was very grateful to a friend who I couldn't fly him back and forth. So for Thanksgiving, there was a friend who lived in California. She invited them over for Thanksgiving. Very grateful to professors. And there were two in particular, Dr. Fraga at Stanford, who's not there anymore, but, but he gave them a job during the summers. I mean, there's always people out there 
sí. ready to help you. It's a matter of finding them. Well, I want to thank you so much, and I have to ask you a big favor. Sure. When you are in the White House, and I know oh. you will be, can you invite all the Adelante women there Absolutely. to a big party? Absolutely, you're all invited. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Rosie Castro. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie.